What's up, guys? Welcome back to the MMA meeting. Let's talk with the Weasel Podcast, where we talk all things MMA, and I hope you guys have an amazing one. I was looking back at some of the UFC 299 fights, because we do know some stuff coming out of those, like BSD had a staff infection, and he was on antibiotics going into it, which I thought was pretty obvious. I mean, he had that big crater on his forehead, and we do know that Jack Della Maddalena had a broken forearm in the Gilbert Burns fight, and I was looking back to see what caused it, because Burns threw quite a few of body kicks that did get blocked by Jack Della, and some some of them did land on the left forearm of Jack. Now, I don't know if the, it was the left forearm or the right forearm that got broken. But specifically, I know in the third round, Burns did land a powerful kick on the left forearm. And that may have broken it, but the articles do say that his arm broke early in the fight. And it could have been any one of those kicks. And it just goes to show you how tough this guy is, man. Jack Della beat Gilbert Burns and finished him with a broken forearm. That is very, very impressive. But it goes to show that he might be out for quite a long time. But so was Shavkat. Actually, Shavkat just came out and said he's going to come back later in the year because he's still recovering from an injury too. So this fight between them two seems to be perfect when it comes to the timeline. They're going to fight each other probably later in the year. They'll both be 100% or close to it. And we get to see who the next number one contender is. By the time that happens, Leon and Blal may have fought each other already and when we look at the Dustin and BSD fight regarding the whole staff infection and everything I mean there is a lot of excuses getting thrown around now that BSD would have won the fight he would have done better he would have ran through him he wouldn't have slowed down all this stuff but yo Dustin pulled a million guillotines right he went for the ghillie so many times they put themselves both at risk for the fight you know what I'm saying of course it's not equivalent because um staph infection antibiotics is very hard to prepare through right train through that and fight through that then pulling guillotines which shows a, a bit of lack of fight IQ and Benoit Saint Denis is really giving a lot of excuses about it he's saying he wasn't the same he was dehydrated it wasn't the same Benoit Saint Denis we've seen in the past and when he fights next time we're going to see the old Benoit Saint Denis and eventually he's going to come back and fight Dustin Poirier get his revenge I understand some of it because he was compromised for sure when you have staph infection you're on antibiotics it's not easy to train and fight through that but there was also an extreme technical issue that we've seen in other fights before you know this is not some new thing out of Benoit Saint Denis where he was exposing his chin in the pocket with his opponent he did the same thing as Thiago Moises he did the same thing in various other fights in the past and it was a big jump up in competition to fight Dustin under those circumstances you know again like I said if it wasn't going to happen in the second round I think eventually would have happened in the third or fourth his chin is way too open to get hit but I don't think it would have really changed the results of the fight really I mean it might have happened later I think Dustin eventually would have caught BSD because staph infection and antibiotics don't ruin your striking defense right? And it's what we saw from BSD before. He has walked into punches many times throughout his career. He doesn't have a lot of technique there. He doesn't defend himself that well. The biggest thing he has shown before was backstepping away. That's generally his main defense. And sometimes he'll pick that left hand up. That's pretty much it. BSD has tried to swarm opponents and bully them many, many times. And even against Thiago Moises, he got caught by some big shots. He is not going to eat the same kind of punches from Dustin Poirier. He's one of the best pocket boxers in the UFC. And trying to box with Dustin Poirier right there is a recipe for disaster. BSD just doesn't have the technique. He's not a great boxer. He's a big, strong guy. And even Dustin said that BSD didn't have a lot of power. Right? He's fought guys with more power. Of course, most likely ref- referencing uh, Justin Gaethje and maybe Michael Chandler. You know, guys who definitely hit harder than BSD. The only thing about BSD that Dustin Poirier said was that in the grappling, he felt very physically strong. But as a puncher, not really. And it's the way that he throws punches. His punches are so wild. They're so without proper form and proper technique. It's just swinging his limbs a lot of times. And then look at the difference between what he's able to do and what Dustin's able to do, right? When Dustin's throwing his punches, it's clean technique, man. Clean, perfect form. That right hook that he hit him with, which he is a a right-hand dominant fighter, I believe, but just southpaw. He allows his power to go through his body at the end of the punch and pass through the opponent's chin. BSD was throwing punches without managing distance that well, and his feet weren't really under him properly. Left himself to get hit cleanly. I don't think a staph infection or antibiotics would have saved him from that. That's a technique problem, right? That's a skill difference. And even Dustin said he was expecting him to gas out later in the fight. He was expecting him to get him third or fourth round. And that's what I was predicting as well. I was thinking that maybe Dustin would be able to get BSD as he slows down in the third or fourth. But because he was compromised going into the fight, he gassed out a little bit sooner. But not to the point where he was completely huffing and puffing. I think that's what people are trying to narrate about this fight. That he was like so gassed out and he couldn't go anymore when that didn't seem to be the case. 
And it just goes to show you, man, these older lightweights are just taking out the younger guys. Maybe not finishing all of them, but they are definitely beating them, right? You see Justin Gaethje defeating Rafael Fazeev, Dustin Poirier now defeating Benoit Saint-Denis. We can say Benil Dariush defeating Matush Gamrat, but I don't hold Dariush at the same caliber I do Dustin and Justin, right? He's an older guy who's been around, not too old, but you know, a guy who's been there for a while. I'm more so looking at the top guys like Dustin and Justin and Charles and Islam now, you know, these guys are starting to take out the younger rising contenders. I won't say Islam's win over Armin is one of those cases, is because Islam wasn't really established at that point. He wasn't a top contender yet. He was still building his own. He was still trying to come up himself. And now we get to see if Charles Oliveira can follow suit against Armin Saryukin. And here's the thing. Charles is the best of those three, right? Him, Justin, and Dustin. Charles is the best of the three. So he's going to go up against the best young rising contender in Armin Saryukin. So it all fits very well. And we did hear that Dustin and Islam want to fight each other. So Dustin was calling out for Islam Makashev in June, but it just doesn't make sense knowing that Dustin got knocked out by Justin Gaethje not too long ago. You know, he's coming off one win against Benoit Saint-Denis, and I think he would need more. Justin and Oliveira definitely deserves the title shot more than Dustin Poirier does. But the only issue is they're both fighting in April, right? So they're both fighting two months before Islam wants to come back. I still think you would have to wait for UFC 300 to finish. We have to wait to see what happens there. Dustin said he came out of the fight with no injury, so he's ready to go. We know Justin said before that he doesn't like to take short turnaround fights. He likes to have long preparations for his next opponent. Oliveira, I don't know what he's willing to do. So it's going to be very interesting. Unless Armin wins or Max Holloway wins, then we got a lot of craziness in this lightweight division that can happen i think regardless the number one contender should be out of that Oliveira and armin fight whether either of them wins and i think justin is over dustin poirier as long as he doesn't lose the max but if max beats justin then it's kind of up in the air right maybe you have them fight each other again that's ultimately what i think i think dustin should go up against the winner of justin and max regardless of who wins the fight and that determines the number one contender for islam makashev after charles Oliveira and armin saryukian but i'm not really going to complain you know Whatever way they go here. I want to see Islam fight somebody in the lightweight division. And I do understand a lot of people that don't want it to be either Oliveira and Armin because Islam already fought both of those guys. There are some people that definitely don't want to see rematch with Islam anymore. He just had a rematch with Alexander Volkanovsky. And if the winner of Oliveira and Armin is going to be the number one contender, that means his next fight is also going to be another rematch regardless of who wins that fight. So I do understand the people that want it to be some new fresh matchup for Islam, which is why I don't really mind if it's any of these guys that fights Islam next. And then regarding the main event of Sean O'Malley and Chito Vera is that Sean O'Malley put on the greatest performance of all time. I would definitely not call it that. It was a great performance, 100%. No disagreements on that, but the greatest performance of all time, he fought Cheeto. And it's nothing against Cheeto, right? He's a great fighter. He's going to be at the top of the division for a long time. He's going to be fighting other great fighters in the bantamweight division. But to have the greatest performance of all time, the opposition has to be factored in as well, right? This is why we don't call Max Holloway's performance against Kelvin Cater the greatest performance of all time because even though it looked like it was and still looks like it is, he fought Kelvin Cater, right? You can't look at that as the greatest performance or Sean O'Malley versus Cheeto's greatest performance when we have Alexander Volkanovsky, what he was able to do against Max Holloway the third time they fought or Conor McGregor versus Eddie Alvarez or TJ Dillashaw versus Hennem Barrow. Their performances in those fights were great, like all-time great status and their opponents were some of the best fighters in the world. Cheeto is not one of the best fighters in the world. As much as we love him, he's one of my favorite fighters to watch at 135. We have to be honest with his skills, though. He's not one of those guys. He just isn't. He wasn't even deserving of this title shot in the first place. The only reason he got this fight with Sean O'Malley is so that it sells well. And it did sell very well with Dustin and a bunch of other fights on the card as well. But it wasn't through a meritocracy. He didn't earn the shot through fights and wins. Corey Sandhagen deserved it more than he did. Marab Davalashvili deserved it more than he did, right? And we know the whole thing between Marab and Eldra during that time, but there was still Corey Sandhagen there. He had a very boring performance in his last one, which, you know, the UFC doesn't like to reward those kind of performances, but he at least deserved it more than Chito Vera. He beat Chito and dominated him too. Like, we have to remember who the opposition was in front of Sean O'Malley. If he could do that to Corey, or if he could do that to Peter Yan, or if he could do that to Marab Davalashvili, okay, now it's something a little bit different, you know? And the thing is, he did fight Peter Yan, and he wasn't able to perform nearly as well against that guy. Opponents make up performances, too. It's not just how good you look, because then Anderson Silva versus Chris Lieben was the greatest performance of all time. That was such a flawless performance, but we can't say that because he fought Chris Lieben. 
But for sure, Sean O'Malley and Chito Vera was a great fight for O'Malley. He showed a lot of his skills out there. He is, in my opinion, a very, very good striker that could be on par with some of the best in the sport. And it's crazy because he didn't even start combat sports in striking. He didn't kick box or box or do Muay Thai or anything like this ever since he was a little kid, you know. In fact, he got into this sport because he wanted to impress girls. And he is one of the best fighters in the world, which is crazy how that turns out. You know, some guys just have a natural talent or a skill in them that they just have to unleash, you know, unlock. And they're able to do some great things, man. Sean O'Malley is definitely one of those guys. He was probably all like, yo, I'm going to get some girls and what's the best way to do it? Oh, I'm going to train an MMA. I'm going to be like this tough guy. You know, I could beat people up and stuff. And then as soon as he starts training and he starts doing well and learning some different kind of techniques and stuff, he was probably like, yo, I'm actually really good at this. I wonder how far I can get with this. But now we have O'Malley talking about fighting Ilya Tapuria. And he did mention Marab. Right, he did mention him that we'll see what happens, but he really wants to fight Ilya. Right, that was the first guy he called out, was the first opponent on his mind. And he's been calling him out for a bit now, you know, a few months. But you got to defend your belt more. There has to be like three title defenses on your record before you can jump up to 145. And he hasn't fought Marab Davalashvili. He didn't fight Corey Sanhagen. He barely beat Peter Jan. There's still a list of contenders for him to beat before he thinks about Ilya Tapuria. And I'm very sick of this whole thing, you know. I'm very sick of like all these champions wanting to jump up weight classes and not defend their belts in their own weight class. Alexander Volkanovsky did it because he earned his shot to do that. He defended his belt enough where it warranted him to go up to 155. It's a different story. But now all these guys want to just jump the line, right? Jump and get past those requirements to go and fight Tapuria as Sean O'Malley. Or Tapuria wants to go and fight Islam. Tapuria didn't even defend his belt once yet. And he even said he doesn't even want to fight the 145ers. Except potentially Max Holloway. This is why I love Alexandra Pantoja's mindset. Because he has a real championship mindset for longevity. The guy already cleaned out most of his division. He just became champion with one title defense. He's 9-0 against the top 15. 9-0. He was cleaning out his division on the way up to becoming a champion. Right? He beat Brandon Moreno three times. He beat Brandon Royval twice. He beat Manel Kep. He beat Matt Schnell. He beat Alex Perez. He beat Kyra Kyra Franz back at tough. And now he's saying he's willing to give Mohamed Mokayev or Steve Urseg a title shot because no one else is ready. Yeah, he did call out Sean O'Malley before. He was talking about jumping up to 135, but there was no one available for him to fight. There was no one that made sense. He either beat everyone available or they were injured or they were coming off losses, right? Kai Kawa France, for an example, is coming off two losses in a row. He was there, right? He was there ready to fight, but then there was a whole talk between him and Manel Kep. We don't know if that was going to go down. Pantoja at the time just wanted to fight somebody, but no one was available. So he was like, all right, might as well go up to 135 and fight Sean O'Malley, right? I want to fight somebody. But now that there is someone lined up, there are two fighters available. Alexander Pantoja is like, okay, give these guys a title shot. Let's go. Let's get this ball rolling. And the funny thing is, I think Pantoja is going to be the longest reigning champion out of all of these guys. He might be your next long reigning champion. And it's not only because of his skill set and how good of a fighter he is. It's also his mentality. He's not trying to go through this fast track to stardom. He has prepared his mind to reign for a long time. And I've been watching the entrances again. So I didn't know how cool Sean O'Malley's entrance was. And Peter Yan's as well. Because uh, Peter Yan has that last boss, like final boss music when he comes out. I'm a big entrance guy. I like looking back at some of the most iconic entrances and stuff. It allows me to like live it all back. You know what I'm saying? But I didn't watch... Ilya Tapuria's entrance when he fought Volkanovski, and man, was that a miss. Tapuria looked so confident coming out there, and then once those nylon strings start playing, Ilya Tapuria telling himself, Yolo Sone, which means pretty much I dreamt this, chills throughout all your body, man, it was so cool. And I don't know what kind of song it was, it sounded like Antonio Banderas, really cool stuff, and it leads to the whole Michael Page thing. Because Michael Page was going to do a whole different entrance than what he actually came out there with. He wanted his entrance to be more Undertaker than it actually was. He said he wanted the lights to dim out. And then they flash on again. And you see Michael Page in the center of the cage. And then they dim out again. They flash on again. Now you see him at the entrance. And then he starts walking to the cage from there. And the guy that appears in the center of the cage was going to be his brother, he said. And that would have been really cool. I'd like to see some more character and personality out of these fighters than just this uniform thing that the UFC wants to do with them. It's so boring when they do it that way. You know, it's so boring to have everybody look the same, dress the same, come out with the same entrances. It lacks interest, man. People don't like that sort of stuff. There are fighters that are known for their entrances more than their fights. 
like Genki Sudo back in the past, a lot of people knew him for his entrances. Everybody remembers Sexy Yama's entrance back in Pride. Jason Miller's entrances were awesome back in the day. Why don't they allow more of that stuff? I, I can see that it can seem kind of silly when everybody's doing this sort of thing, but I think people appreciate it, especially the casual fans. The casual fans will love that sort of stuff. Even at one championship, they're allowing it, right? Ryzen is allowing that stuff. Like when they allow Michelle Pereira to have his whole dance routine and allow Michael Page to come out with the whole Undertaker theme, it makes things a lot more exciting. Even at one, you have Stamp Fairtex who has a whole dance routine every single time she comes out and the fans love it. Why not allow this stuff with any fighter that wants to do it? You can have the fighters that want to come out serious and, you know, not have this whole like routine going on every time they come out with an entrance. Let them have that. But it'd be really cool to also allow fighters to put on a show even for their entrance as well, right? Michael Page could be a big star in the sport if he keeps winning, of course, which is the most important thing, but also allow him to have these kind of entrances and allow him to show his personality out there. Those are the kind of stuff that's going to make him go viral. Remember back in the day when he kneed Cyborg Santos in the face, crushed his skull, and then he threw the Pokeball at him? The Pokeball part was viral. I mean, that went everywhere. I remember so many people memeing about that more than the flying knee itself. And I also do think that the Pokemon Go game was big at the time. So that was probably a big reason as to why Michael Page even came out with the Pokeball. These fighters are not allowed to have their own sponsors in the cage. They all dress the same. At least allow them to dance during their entrances. You know what I'm saying? And it was really cool to see Michael Page perform that well out there. You know, a guy who's been in the Bellator for such a long time. He was known as this can crusher, which he was doing. I mean, a lot of guys he fought over there were not that good. But he did fight a couple of good guys, you know, he did fight Douglas Lima, and I think Douglas Lima, you can argue, is potentially on the same level, if not a higher level, than Kevin Holland. But Styles make fights, and Kevin Holland's not a technician on the feet, he rarely even shoots for takedowns. In fact, Michael Page, I think, is the only fighter in a very long time that turned Kevin Holland into a wrestler, right? A guy who refused to wrestle against Stephen Thompson, who has a similar style to Michael Venom Page, more than anybody else Kevin Holland's ever fought before. But because of how frustrated he was and how many shots he was eating from Michael Page, he had to resort to his grappling, which was a big confidence booster for Michael Page, knowing that Kevin Holland had very little for him in the striking. And it was to be seen, you know, this is a big reason as to why I picked Michael Page to win this, because Kevin Holland, he has good distance management when he's fighting much shorter fighters, and most of the fighters at 170 are shorter than he is in every dimension, right? Michael Page is the same height and has a similar kind of reach to him, so when you have these similar dimensions to Kevin Holland, he's going to have a lot harder time of dictating distance on you. And it was Michael Page that was dominating the distance striking between them because it's just what he's been doing ever since he was a little kid. He's a point fighter. He comes from point contact karate. This is all they do. This is what they master, distance striking. And Kevin Holland has a nice right hand. It's better form than anything else he throws. All the other punches are flailing. You know, it's very hard to hit someone as fast and as sharp as Michael Page, even if he is 36 years old. He hasn't shown to be slowing down at all in his career, so if Kevin Holland could not have anything going with the grappling, I always thought that Michael Page would dominate him in the stand-up. But would that go the same for the future opponents of Michael Page? Because this welterweight division is now very interesting with him included. So we know some of the opponents that these fighters are calling out for their next fights, and Michael Page specifically said that Stephen Thompson, probably not the next opponent for him. He said the fight would understandably be kind of boring, right? They'll probably point fight with each other, just land tap for tat, body kick for body kick, jab for jab, and they'll go on for five rounds. They're also friends with each other, and Wonderboy said in the past that he wouldn't like to fight Michael Page either. So that fight is probably not going to happen. But I think Michael Page versus Jeff Neal is the next good step up. Jeff Neal's in the top 10. MVP just beat a top 15 in Kevin Holland. I think that's a good logical step up, but we have to also note that he is 36 years old. So they probably want to jump up Michael Page in competition rather quickly given his age. Maybe a similar route to like Michael Chandler, who he got thrown the wolves right away, but a bit of a slower pace because Chandler's first fight was Dan Hooker. Then he fought Charles Oliveira for the interim title. Michael Page will go top 15, top 10, top 5 title shot if he does win those fights. So he just beat the top 15 in Kevin Holland. Next top 10 is probably Jeff Neal. And if he gets through him, we'll see what happens after that. But there is a possibility they could throw him Gilbert Burns, right? Gilbert Burns is ranked number 6. Jeff Neal is number 10. That would be also a good step up of competition for Michael Page. But it would be stylistically a much harder fight because if he gets taken to the ground by Burns, he might get submitted. His grappling is not all that. You know, he's a way better striker than Burns in almost every aspect. And Burns might be a little bit chinny, you know? Any one shot from Michael Page could put Burns down, but any single takedown from Burns can end the fight the other way. And if he gets past Burns, maybe give him the loser of Jack Della and Shafkat, or the loser of Leon and Bilal. And if he gets through them, give him a title shot. 
But I think his next fight should be either Jeff Neal or Gilbert Burns. I know a lot of people are talking about him fighting Ian Gary or Jack Della Maddalena, but those two guys are calling out their next opponents as well. So Jack Della should be fighting Shafkat. He's on track in a similar timeline to come back from the injury to go up against Shafkat later in the year. And Ian Gary's calling out Colby Covington. So let's have those two fights go on. We'll have MVP against Burns or Neal. And I think he beats Jeff Neal, but he has a very tough time with Gilbert Burns. It depends how that fight goes down. Burns is older. He's taking a lot more damage than MVP has. It can really go either way. It depends who executes their game plan quicker than the other. Burns does not want to stay in the stand-up with MVP too long, but if he can get that double leg in there right away, MVP is going to be in a lot of trouble, man. Wait, Colby went up a rank in the top five? Now he's number four, where he was number five before, but Burns came out the top five, so he went down two spots. Jack Dell is number five now. Yeah, welterweight's in a very interesting place. And did you guys hear about Mark Coleman? He's in um, pretty bad shape in the hospital. He's in critical condition. He saved both of his parents from a burning house, and then he went back into the house to save their dog, but passed out inside, and the dog reportedly passed away. And Mark Coleman's 59 years old. To go into a burning house at his age, to go save his parents, I mean, how old are his parents? What a hero. We need more men like him in society. Because I did watch this one video once, and it it was infuriating. I mean, if you, any of you guys seen this video, you guys are probably want to like punch a wall or something. I don't know what country it was, but there was this couple walking outside with the kid, and random lady comes up with a, how should I say, a weapon, and started thrusting it at their kid. Some of you may have seen this video and they didn't know what was happening. They weren't fast to react, which is a shame on both of them, but more so on the father because what the father does, he grabs the kid away, starts screaming at the lady. The lady comes after the kid again, and he doesn't do anything. He's just holding on to the kid. He doesn't give the kid to the mother to go away with, and he handles the attacker, right? And then he had this one last attempt with the, when the lady was walking away. He ran after her. She looked at him, and then he cowered away again. He ran backwards. I'm like, how do you even call yourself a father? If you can't defend your own kid, if you can't defend your own wife, what are you doing? What is your role in this relationship? This random obese lady just shanked your kid in the face. What are you doing? So when I see a story like this about Mark Coleman going into a burning house at 59 years old to save both of his parents and their dog, it's a heroic effort that we should all aspire to be like, you know? I don't know if there's any like GoFundMe page or anything like that for Mark Coleman, but I hope he gets the help he needs. And with that, let's go right to the questions and we're going to start with Nano Peach. And guys, try to keep it to one question. Hello, Weasel. I hope you and the fam are good. Thank you so much, man, and yours as well. First thing, I feel like Cheeto's game plan was bad. What would your game plan be for Cheeto Vera? Generally, everything's going to be about pressure and cutting off the cage. If he could jab his way in and line up body shots on O'Malley as he's trying to look for the counter shot on the back foot, I think solid fundamental defense, holding up the hands, not exploding with too many combinations, should be able to get him on the inside of O'Malley, at least close enough to the fence, as O'Malley's always going to be moving away whenever you're pressuring him. And O'Malley was moving out a lot to the left throughout that fight. So if he could line up body shots as he's exiting it away, or even a right hook, kind of similar to what Ilya was doing against Alexander Volkanovsky, I think that would have been really good for him. Try to stay in O'Malley's face the whole fight would be the ultimate game plan for him. Just to get his way in there is going to have to revolve a lot on the fundamentals of boxing. Really use the jab to enter into range. Then your next question, for BSD, the first round was dominant. If he didn't have the staff, do you think he could have kept up that pace? I don't think so. I think eventually he would have slowed down in the later rounds. He's never been past the third round in his entire career. He's a big guy that cuts a lot of weight, and he was putting on a lot of pressure on Dustin, especially in the ground. Grappling. The takedowns, though, were not as laboring because Dustin was just pulling the guillotine, which made it easy for Benoit to get it to the ground. But I think eventually Benoit would have started gassing out and he would have got hit a lot throughout that fight. Those punches were not only landing because Benoit was slowing down. He was open in the stand-up a lot throughout that fight. Then your next question, what are Elias chances against Sean at 45? I think Sean actually has a good striking style against Ilya. A good mover, hard to track down, hard to cut off, very good at distance, can punish anytime Ilya overextends with the right hand, which he does very often. He was even overthrowing and overextending on his right hand when he fought Volkanovski. And any one of those openings is perfect for Sean O'Malley's backstep right counter. O'Malley also has really good high kicks he can mix up in there, good low kicks. I think ultimately though, Ilya's grappling will be the difference in the fight. I think he would take Sean O'Malley to the ground eventually, shooting the double leg against the fence. Ilya is one of the better guys at cutting off the cage when he's not overthrowing his punch. I think he gets him to the ground and eventually submits him 
after hitting with a lot of ground and pound shots. I do think O'Malley can perform better than a lot of people anticipate. He has a good striking style against Tapuria. He's also going to be longer and faster. Works better at angles than anybody else Tapuria has fought. Is extremely dynamic in both southpaw and orthodox. He could find good tapes to the body, turn those into question mark kicks to the head, and I believe everything will go Tapuria's way if he gets the fight to the ground. But will Tapuria approach the fight that way? There is a scenario where he doesn't try to take O'Malley to the ground, and it could be too late. O'Malley is going to look to try to knock this guy out to where it might overextend with some of his punches and leave himself open to get countered as O'Malley showcasing his footwork out there. It's the first few phases where all of the damage is really going to settle in. And after those few phases, O'Malley might, O'Malley, if O'Malley doesn't hurt Tapuria and exit on an angle, he's going to get pushed up to the fence and that's where Tapuria can land his right hand. And also the body shots. We've seen Cheeto even land good body shots on O'Malley. They're going to feel so much worse from Tapuria. Right, O'Malley even said at the end of the Cheeto fight, when he started to exchange with Cheeto a little bit, he got hit to the body really hard, and he even acknowledged it in an interview. When you look at O'Malley, it looks like you can hurt him if you hit him right to the body, because O'Malley doesn't seem to have like a strong body, you know, to take body shots, especially from someone like Taporia. You know, a, a couple liver shots from Taporia, and that fight could be over. Anytime he gets O'Malley stuck in the cage, he will blow him up. O'Malley would definitely explode into rainbow confetti. So O'Malley definitely does not want to be on the fence whatsoever. But yeah, I ultimately do think that Taporia beats Sean O'Malley, and I would pick him as an early prediction to beat him by a submission on the ground or by ground and pound. And I know O'Malley was talking about it before that he said he wants to fight Taporia in September, and you know, they're looking to do something in Spain. I don't know when they're going to do that, but if it is September, I don't know if they're going to do the O'Malley fight, man. That doesn't really make much sense. I think O'Malley has to fight Marab at the end of the day, and it should probably be Max Holloway if he loses the Geishi. He goes up against Taporia probably in September or something. Then Shaf covers Della. And DJ says that AJ would beat Francis in an MMA fight. Your thoughts, analysis for both of those. Thanks for your content. And as always, much love from the North Pole. Thank you so much, man. Shavka versus Jack Della Madalena. I would go with Shavka in this fight. I think Jack Della has a hard time striking from distance. He will lunge for punches. He will throw some body kicks here and there, some leg kicks. But ultimately, I think the jab from Shavka and any time Jack wants to jump into distance, he's going to get countered by the one, two or a left hook. I can see some leg kicks and front kicks from Shafka landing as well, maybe a potential spinning kick to the head if he reads Jack's angles. And even if Jack gets in close, which he will have success with his boxing, Shafka could clinch up with him, land some good knees and elbows, and potentially even trip him out. Shafka's best takedowns are from the clinch. Not the best means of getting the fight to the ground, but there is a problem from Jack if he does get in close with that clinch. So ultimately, I do pick Shafka to win that fight, but it should be a good one. And as for AJ versus Francis, I'm still surprised DJ said that, and he is even doubling down on it. He said he could train AJ to fight Francis in MMA. Six months will all it take for him to beat him, which is crazy. No, Francis hits him with one leg kick from distance, further distance than what AJ's used to in boxing. That one leg kick makes AJ rethink this entire thing. And Gano shoots a double leg, gets him to the ground, ground and pounds him for a finish. There's no way AJ would be able to stuff his takedown with even six months of training. I mean, this guy out-wrestles Surreal Gan with knee injuries, and Surreal Gan has been practicing wrestling and grappling for years by that point. There's no way Anthony Joshua would pick up on it in six months, and Surreal Gan's also a very athletic guy too. Then we got the Troy Hartung. Let's say both Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz never went on their hiatuses from 2017 to 2018, and Conor never boxed with Floyd Mayweather. What do you think would have been their next fights? I'll mention what I think should have been next for them, but I'm curious on your take first. Conor McGregor would have fought either Tony Ferguson or Habib after that, because we do know that Habib and Tony were supposed to fight for the interim title. Habib pulled out of their fight in October 7 of 2017. Tony fought Kevin Lee instead, but none of that would have happened. It would have been Conor versus Tony or Conor versus Habib. Regardless, it would have been Tony at the end of the day because Habib did get sick. Whether Tony was going to be a replacement, a backup fighter, or he would have been the one to fight Conor McGregor first, that fight would have happened. Maybe Conor wins, who knows? That fight goes down. And as for Nate Diaz, I think he would have fought the other guy. So let's say Conor fought Tony Ferguson, then Nate probably would have fought Habib or vice versa. And you say for Conor, I think he should have defended the belt against Habib in March, April, instead of it being an interim belt between Tony and Habib. Conor just got the belt in November. So why would they immediately make an interim belt in March? Do you think the UFC knew Conor was going to be out for a while when they made the Tony Habib interim title fight? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do. They probably had talks, you know, plans about, you know, going into the whole boxing thing. And for that reason, they were probably thinking about this whole interim title. And then for Nate Diaz, you say, I think the UFC understood how big of a household name Nate became 
They should have offered him a fight for UFC 209 against Tony Ferguson. To me, that should have been the main event for 209 instead of Tyron Woodley versus Wonderboy 2. Or maybe Nate versus Tony is the co-main event as a five-rounder. Do you think the 2017 version of you would have been more exciting for that as the main event? And could Nate have been just a big of a pay-per-view star as Connor if he stayed active right after the Connor rematch? Back in 2017, I definitely would have been more excited to watch Tony versus Nate than Woodley versus Wonderboy 2. And no, I don't think Nate would have been as big of a star as Connor, but he definitely would have sold a lot of pay-per-views if he was active. And then lastly, with the UFC in a situation where its popularity was not growing in 2017, thanks to Nate and Connor both being gone, why didn't the UFC do everything in their power to try to give them both an insanely lucrative deal to fight multiple times that year? With Connor, I can understand because he wanted to fight Floyd Mayweather, but Nate should have been recognized as a new gold mine for the company. I don't know exactly why they weren't giving them any kind of deal to fight again, or they weren't like super aggressive to have him back. But we do know that the ESPN deal with the UFC happened in like 2018, and maybe they're already in somewhat talks behind the scenes. And I heard that they didn't have to be as focused on stars when that deal happened, right? Because they were getting a guaranteed pay regardless of whatever they sell. So to have Connor and Nate back wasn't necessarily a priority anymore. But back in 2017, it was a little bit different, of course, because of the whole Floyd Mayweather thing happening. And you have to also remember when GSP came back, right? There were also in talks of GSP coming back to fight Michael Bisping at that time, right? Another superstar in the sport. John Jones was to fight Daniel Cormier that year. So they weren't really starving of stars at the time. And then the ESPN deal hit the next year. So that might have been a reason as to why they weren't so focused on Nate and Connor at that point because they had other stars around the Floyd fight was happening and a new deal with ESPN and others were in negotiations probably around the end of that year or maybe early of 2018 I forgot exactly when that happened and then with a Mike Griffith MVP put on one of the best performances against Kevin Holland I heard you said that you would like to see him against Wonderboy but I have a much more fun fight in mind how about MVP versus Michelle Pereira? What are your thoughts on that one? You don't agree that that's a better dynamic matchup. Um, they're in different weight classes, right? Michelle Pereira should not be coming down to 170 anymore. He's a way better fighter at 185. And MVP, I think, is a bit too skinny to go up to 185 against some of those guys that could take him to the ground and muscle him. Your next question, I have a hard feeling that Dana might make that Sean O'Malley versus Ilya Tapuria fight. If that fight happens, who do you think wins and why? I think Ilya wins for the reasons I gave before. I think Tapuria ultimately will win through his grab. And your last question, out of these two, who do you enjoy more? Which of these two fights gets you to pay for pay-per-view faster? Oh, definitely Tapuria and O'Malley. That's actually a very exciting fight. It just shouldn't happen right now because I think the champions should get like three title defenses at minimum before going up to the next weight class. And then we go to Prince Malcolm. Was Jelton Almeida getting slept the most satisfying knockout in recent memory? Um, no... No, it wasn't like super satisfying. I don't like the whole lay and praying style. Jalton Meda will submit you if he gets a chance, but the way he was fighting Curtis Blaze was definitely not fun to watch, except that one skirmish they had in the stand-up for a brief moment in the second round. But the whole shooting against the fence and holding him, trying to take him to the ground and laying and praying, I can't lie, it was kind of exciting to see Curtis Blades find a solution to that as quickly as he did. I mean, he did not waste any time. As soon as Almeida was on his hips, Blade just started hammering him, dude. I can't lie, it was pretty hype. But no, I won't say it's the most satisfying knockout in recent memory. I don't really, like, get mad at fighters to have, like, a most satisfying knockout. Usually my satisfying knockouts are, like, some spectacular technique, like Joaquin Buckley hitting Impa Kazanage with that one kick, you know? Or Sean O'Malley putting Eljo down with that one perfectly placed punch. Or Conor McGregor knocking out Josie Aldo, even though Josie Aldo is my favorite fighter ever, him and Anderson Silva. I can't lie that the punch that Conor hit him with was super satisfying to watch. That sort of stuff for me are like the satisfying moments in the sport. I've been watching this sport for so long that loving and hating fighters is not a thing anymore for me. So I look for really good fights and really good moments in the sport. And I mentioned it before, it happens with every fan. You know, when you watch for a long enough time, you start not to have these favorites anymore. And you only see it as fighter A versus fighter B. Because all your favorites have gotten knocked out, slapped, destroyed. They're around too long and it's just sad to see. And then eventually you grow numb to all these fighters and you don't really care if they win or lose. And at that point, you just want to see good fights and that's it. Then we go to Uriel. How does Michael Venom Page do against the top 15 at welterweight? Okay, so number 15 is Michael Chiesa. I think he sleeps Michael Chiesa. Way too hittable, way too open, even when he's aggressive looking for a takedown. He could even hit him with a flying knee as well. And we know how dangerous those are from Michael Page. Kevin Holland, he beats him again. Neil Magny easily beats him. Vicente Luque can have some success 
success on the ground if he's able to get it there, but I think ultimately Michael Page would beat him. Footwork is way too much. That's generally the biggest difference between them two. Jeff Neal, I'll go with Michael Page. Wonderboy, I'll also go with Michael Page. Sean Brady, I'd probably go Sean Brady. Ian Gary, I'll go with Michael Page, but that's a very difficult fight. Gilbert Burns, I'm going to go with Burns. Jack Della, I'm going to go with Jack. Colby Covington, it depends what version of Colby we get. If we get prime Colby, I'm going to definitely go with Colby. If we don't get prime Colby and we see the guy that fought Leon, I will go with Michael Page. I got Shavka against MVP. I got Bilal Muhammad against MVP. I got Usman against MVP. And I got Leon against MVP. Then we'll go to Yoel Castro. Will Bilal ever get a title shot or will he be relegated back with contenders such as Shavka and now JDM in the top four? He's even still ranked below Usman in the rankings despite Usman losing three straight. Yeah, he will get a title shot. It's just you can tell that Dana does not like the Bilal and Leon fight. I mean, they were talking about guys for Leon to fight at UFC 300, and none of them were Bilal Muhammad, uh, according to Ariel Hawani. That alone tells you that they really aren't interested in this Bilal fight. But I think if Hamza doesn't jump the queue, you know, it comes down to 170, and he's a big enough of a star to jump over Bilal or something, he can negotiate with his win against Kamar Usman, technically. He could get above Bilal for a title shot, but I think Bilal is the most deserving until Shafka and Jack Della fight each other. Because here's the other thing. We want to see Leon fight more. Right, he's been inactive for so much of his career. He's got to get some fights going. Then with the BDP daily. With Almeida getting slapped after spamming takedown after takedown with zero damage, got me wondering, what's the most satisfying KO in recent memory? Thank goodness this dude got put out. Most satisfying KO in recent memory. I would say O'Malley's punch at Aljamain was very satisfying. That's one of the cleanest punches ever landed in MMA. Cheeto's knockout on Dominic Cruz was crazy. Dustin Poirier's knockout on Benoit St. Denis was very clean. Vinicius Oliveira knocking out Bernardo Sopai was also pretty crazy, but not because Sopai got knocked out. That was a hard part of it to watch. Marcus McGee's TKO against Bolaños was so crisp. Ilya Deporia knocking out Alexander Volkanovsky was also a big one. A lot of really good knockouts. Look at the OxyClean. How do you think Marab does against Sean after the Vera 2 fight? Sean is so tall and long for Bantamweight while being a sniper. I think it's going to be a while until someone beats him. I think Marab beats him. O'Malley is really good at what he does. He's a very, very good striker. Impeccable distance management. I mean, he understands the striking game better than most do. And Marab will be there to get hit a few times, but we've seen him rally back after he does get hurt. And I just don't see O'Malley stopping the takedowns. You know, his chance of winning the fight is to get Marab out of there before he's able to get on his legs. Because I think if Marab does shoot on him, he will get him to the ground and he will start to dominate on top. And I do think that pace will start to zap O'Malley if the fight goes into the later rounds. And specifically, Specifically, there is an entryway for Marab past Sean O'Malley's jab. When O'Malley likes to jab and move in and out, he will oftentimes only look for the counter with a straight or an overhand, potentially a left hook, but Marab is always going to be changing levels. So regardless of any of those punches, he will get under those. O'Malley's going to have to time an uppercut or a knee or something like that because there is a big trend in the sport where fighters are just not understanding of what punch to throw against wrestlers. And it's crazy to think about because how often do you see fighters throwing overhands against wrestlers? It happens way too often. When the, the proper punch should be just aiming your punches a lot lower as the wrestler is going to be looking to change levels. And everything they do is just with their head touching the ground. You know what I'm saying? They're constantly lowering their levels, whether they're throwing an overhand, whether they're shooting a takedown, whether they're faking low and they're coming up with an uppercut. A lot of their attacks are usually with this lower motion. It's either lower rising up or just staying low. That means all the punches to intercept them should come at a lower arc. And I don't know if O'Malley is going to have that kind of arsenal with him when he's moving backwards because at some point in the fight, I don't know if it's going to be early or it's going to be later, he will start to move backwards. Look at the joist. Poirier's walkout song is a perfect representation of his fighting style. Are there any other fighter walkout songs that stick out to you? Oh yeah, his song, um, The Boss by James Brown. The chorus is, paid the cost to be the boss. It is quite of a fitting name for Dustin Poirier. You know, he does have that model paid in full, you know, to be where he's at. But any other fighter's entrance song that really sticks out to me, I mentioned before with Ilya Tapuria, that song is awesome, man. Jose Aldo's Run This Town for a long time was very, very fitting. Anderson Silva, DMX's Ain't No Sunshine. Dude, that was iconic, man. When that song started to ring out in the arena, you know his opponent was not going to see any sunshine. You know what I'm saying? I thought Luke Rockle's theme song as Chris Wyman was pretty cool. The Rain by DMX, regarding Chris Wyman's reign and how Luke Rockles wanted to stop it. Dominic Cruz's song against TJ Dillashaw. That was perfect. Hearing Warren G's song, Nobody Does It Better. 
against TJ Dillashaw was so fitting, man. Because back in those days, a lot of people were saying that TJ Dillashaw copied Dominic Cruz. And even TJ said he learned a lot from Cruz and developed a, a kind of like a footwork style that resembles him a little bit. And the Cruz made sure to come out to a theme song telling everybody nobody does it better. You know, they can come closer than close, but original they never will be. Then a remix into some Cypress Hill. The best entrance ever, though, in my opinion, was Yoshiro Akiyama's entrance against Kazushi Sakuraba. Even though the song is a bit of a meme and it's super overplayed, the entrance was so hard. He came out to Time to Say Goodbye by Andrew Pacelli and Sarah Brightman. Fedor had a menacing entrance song, man. He seemed like the final boss whenever he came out there. I think TJ Dillashaw's theme song also fit him very well. Can't Stop by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Habib's as well, the Dagestan song. Oh, and Korean Zombies. Korean Zombies entrance song, even though the context of the song is probably not what Korean Zombie intends to come out to, it's still so iconic. And a personal favorite of mine is Curtis Blades coming out to the Mortal Kombat theme song. That is really cool. Leota Machida, I think, came out to the Game of Thrones song too once. Yeah, just so many different fighters that have really cool entrances. Then we go to the next question by JG. R.I.P. Toriyama. Yeah, absolutely, man. Akira Toriyama, for those who don't know who he is, he's the one that created Dragon Ball. Um, Dragon Ball, specifically Dragon Ball Z, is a big inspiration during my childhood. And I'm not going to lie, even though it can sound a little bit cheesy, Dragon Ball Z was... The thing early on in my life that taught me about perseverance and train hard, keep going, you know, live a healthy lifestyle and all this stuff, you know, sleep well, eat well, and how important that is to pursue your goals in life. For me, one of the greatest pieces of fiction or of work that I've ever watched in my entire life. We can be like a critic of the story and maybe some of the plot and the characters and stuff like that. But for what it was, especially back in the 90s, I watched it in the early 2000s. Regardless, it sits in a very special place for all of us. There's a lot of really cool characters, a lot of cool moments throughout that entire story. My favorite character is not Goku. I know a lot of people do like Goku, but I always thought Goku was like a very generic good guy. But was he really a good guy in that sense? I mean, he did cause a lot of issues on the planet and as well as uh, leaving his kids to be raised by Piccolo. So he kind of was a deadbeat dad in a way. Nah, but Goku's so cool. My favorite though was Vegeta. Vegeta had the most depth and character. Even still to this day, there are not a lot of written characters in any story that resembles anything like Vegeta or at least do it as well as Toriyama did for Vegeta. And it's kind of interesting because I think Toriyama did say that Vegeta is his least favorite character. Yet he wrote him better than almost any other character in the story. Resembling pride in what you are and who you are, you know, where you come from, is a thing that resembles for a lot of people, you know? Always trying to get stronger, always trying to come up against the biggest challenges in his life and overcome it all. Yeah, so Vegeta is my favorite character. Other favorites are Piccolo. I really like him. They did a really good job throughout the whole story developing his character, but he became kind of like a babysitter, which was annoying. Both versions of Broly are really cool. The Dragon Ball Z one and the Dragon Ball Super one. I think the Super version is a lot better depth right? But he's not as cool as original Broly. Bro, I used to watch so much AMVs about that. You know, they used to play like Roy Jones Jr. can't be stopped with Broly just 1v5-ing. Future Trunks is really cool. I like that special they made about him. And I really like Tien. Even though Tien is fodder, you can't deny the man's heart. And my favorite moments throughout Dragon Ball Z were number one's Final Atonement, when Vegeta sacrifices himself to try to eliminate Majin Buu, but of course it didn't work, as usually goes on with Vegeta ever having this last stand against anybody he fights. Of course, the first Super Saiyan transformation was super cool. That thing blew me away when I was a kid. Goku's warp Kamehameha against uh, Cell was pretty cool. When you first watched that, nobody saw that coming. Tien's tri-beam against Nappa was underrated, even though that didn't do anything to him. Vegeta's final flash on Cell. Goku sacrifice against Cell. And when I first watched that, I thought Goku did it. You know, I was like, oh, he, he defeated Cell. This is the end of it. And then just to see the guy come back threw everybody into a loop. When Vegeta is dying and he has that message to Goku, right, he's telling him to avenge his people and, you know, become the Super Saiyan that he is and all that stuff. And then Frieza finishes him off. That was kind of crazy. And Vegeta also admitting Goku is the best at the end of Dragon Ball Z. Those are some of my favorite moments of the show. We have some really good villains throughout that story too, like Cell and Frieza. I do like Dragon Ball Z way more than Dragon Ball Super though, right? Dragon Ball Super kind of seemed a little bit too fan servicey, even though the the Boo Saga was very fan service. Super kind of did it with not as interesting of a storyline, in my opinion. Some cool fights though, some cool transformations and stuff like that. 
I thought the whole Zamasu thing was an interesting concept, but the whole traveling back and forth in time and knowing how Zamasu got wiped out seemed a little bit anticlimactic for me and a little too overly convoluted. The Tournament of Power is pretty cool and all, but the reason why I like Dragon Ball Z a lot more is also because they use their side characters, I think, better than Super did. Like, for an example, when Tien was holding back Cell, that was so cool, man. They actually used a what you would thought a worthless character to actually be useful in a way. And I always thought Tien was really cool when he shot Nappa with that one blast and ended himself doing it too. He was always willing to put it on the line just to try to save the day any way he can. The only character that can kick rocks is Yamcha. He lost to a Cyberman. Then he trained for the whole Android thing and then got one tapped by Dr. Jiro. Dude, Chao Tzu is way more of a beast than Yamcha is. The only character I think they dropped the ball though in Dragon Ball Z was uh, Gohan because Gohan was always supposed to be the strongest character, but he just wasn't a fighter at heart. And when the Buu Saga came, he was just like a regular student. And every single time he had to get stronger than everybody else, it was just through this unlocked potential of his more than actually training for it. That's why the Cell Saga was sick because Gohan trained for that. You know, he didn't just go through this magical special thing with the Kais and just became stronger because they helped unlock his potential. No Gohan will ever trump Super Saiyan 2 Gohan against Cell. That's the best version of Gohan ever. Even this new one, this Beast Gohan stuff that they did with this new movie. He's the strongest again, outside of like Beerus and these other characters they've introduced. He's like the strongest mortal or something like that, but still the same kind of guy. Dragon Ball Z is super cool. I'm a big fan. I've always been a big fan of Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball Super. I'm also a big fan of other anime. You know, I know uh, the guy that made Berserk passed away a couple of years ago. Berserk, in my opinion, is one of the greatest stories ever told of any fiction, not just anime, manga, or anything like that, any fiction. There's very little stories that were created like Berserk was. But yeah, RIP to Akira Toriyama. If it wasn't for him, we also wouldn't get other anime like Bleach, for an example. Maybe even Naruto would have been way different than it is. And he inspired even not just people from the East, but people from the West. We definitely know the Latin community is definitely going through it, man. Then we go to the next question by Vivid MMA. Number one, how do you think Rebellas de Spain does against Francis Ngannou? I will go with Francis Ngannou until Rebellas de Spain proves otherwise. He's way too green. Not much is known about him. His fights, even in MMA, are lasting five seconds sometimes, you know? We got to see more from him before we know how good he actually is. And number two, what is your list of the top 15 greatest MMA fighters of all time look like? I, I don't know. Greatest fighters of all time? Not in any kind of order. Off the top of my head, I'll say GSP, Demetrius Johnson, Jose Aldo, Stipe Miocic, Fedor, Habib, maybe Dominic Cruz, Kamaru Usman, Volkanovski, Israel Adesanya, Daniel Cormier, Henry Cejudo, Dan Henderson, maybe, Randy Couture, and Chuck Liddell. I don't have any fighters that illegally pop for PEDs on my list. Then we go to Jay the Meme King. How would you score fights if you had complete control over judging? Damage over volume, ground control over submission threats, round by round or whole fight, what would the Weasel Judging Commission look like? So I would definitely trump damage over volume and submission threat over control. I think scoring fights as a whole rather than round by round is a much better way to do it. I don't think cuts and bruising and stuff like that should be as much of a factor in accordance to damage because there's some fighters that bruise and swell and cut easier than others, which is not fair according to the judging criteria. I think things like pressure and aggression and octagon control and all that other stuff should also play into factor into judging while damage and submission threats and all that other stuff are as well you know effective striking and grappling shouldn't be the only thing that people are looking at to judge a fight because that's essentially what it is right now right it has this like supremacy order and i don't think that order is the way to do it i still think effective striking and grappling should be the top of the order but all the other stuff should also be counted as well at the same time also point deductions for grabbing the cage eye poking low blows all that stuff should definitely have a lot less leniency than they have right now in fights and draws should definitely be counted more, right? Don't make it impossible to score a draw. That's silly because there are some fights that should be draws. But the way that they score fights right now, it makes draws nearly impossible. If a round is too close to call, just give it a draw. That's what it should be. They make a fight way too complex to score. Then we're going to pull Honeypot. Do you think Cheeto's legendary chin might be cracked after the damage he sustained this weekend? How do you see a match between him and Jan going down? No, I don't think his chin is cracked. Cheeto doesn't take that much damage in fights in general. So I think it would take more than what he sustained against O'Malley to crack his chin. 
But how does a fight between him and Jan go down? I think Jan beats him. I think he could wrestle him if he wants to go that route. And because of Chito's slow pace, it's going to allow Jan to really understand and read everything that Chito does from his defense specifically, though. Read more defense and offense. I think he will find openings on Chito. I think as the fight plays out, he's going to up the pace. And eventually, he will build up to where he's fighting faster than Chito is. And Chito will not be able to keep up with him. But I also do think that the fight would be very competitive up until the later rounds. And final question, we're going to go to Jax. How do you see Pantoja versus DJ going if Demetrius returns to take back his belt? That's low-key a good fight, man. DJ's definitely the better striker of the two. He's way faster, especially in the stand-up. He has better wrestling. Pantoja's going to be bigger than him. He's going to be physically stronger, most likely. And he's going to be dangerous on the ground. He has the power advantage on the stand-up. He's tough, durable. I don't see him getting knocked out at all. But I believe DJ should be able to beat him with a strike-and-move kind of strategy. Land the leg kick, keep moving around. Land the jab, move around. Combination, move around. Round. And every single time Pantoja tries to reach in for some big counter hook, DJ's probably going to counter most of those. A lot of things could go Pantoja's way if he does connect on DJ, or if he connects some hard hook, he intercepts some of the knee coming in, he takes DJ to the ground, try to muscle him. I don't think it's an easy fight at all for Demetrius Johnson, but I do pick Demetrius to beat him in a very close decision win. The main thing from Pantoja, the main thing lacking from Pantoja is clean striking technique at the level of DJ's. If he had that, I would definitely pick him to beat DJ, but because of the way he strikes, he's a bit wild and does take a lot of shots, I wouldn't pick him to beat Demetrius. But funny enough, can you arguably call Pantoja the second greatest flyweight of all time? If you really think about it, the guys that he has beaten, he has the second most title defenses in flyweight history with Henry Cejudo and Davis and Figueredo. Davidson held the belt a little bit longer, of course, because he did have that draw against Moreno the first time they fought. But when you consider the guys that, you know, Figueredo and Pantoja beat, who would you put ahead of the other? Davison has two wins against Joseph Benavidez. He did beat Alexander Pantoja, and he has one win against Brendan Moreno. But Pantoja beat Moreno three times. He beat Roy Val twice. He beat Kep. He beat Kai Kawa France way back in the day. I think it's kind of close, man. Pantoja, I would say give him one more win as a champion. He's the second greatest right after DJ. But the thing is, he would still be very far away from DJ status. I mean, for the second greatest flyweight to only have one title defense, whereas Demetrius Johnson had 11, he literally has the UFC record. It's hard to imagine anybody rivals Demetrius Johnson's greatness in that flyweight division. And very few fighters in all weight classes. And that is the end of the episode, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you give that video a like. Make sure to subscribe hit the bell for notifications and i'll see you guys in the next video